Welcome, everyone, to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast, and I am your host, Supreme Decisions. Well, today, for you guys that can actually see me, you can see I'm at a park area here in Georgia. And, you know, for whatever reason, I actually still like being outside, even though we're putting together a new studio, and we're offering ourselves an opportunity to grow beyond where we were at and even grow beyond where I thought we would be in the respects of the opportunities are coming. I'm taking advantage of many of them. And I'm also thanking you guys for making it possible for those advantages to to be taken care of. Well, let's go ahead and just dive on into it a little bit. I've been dealing with a lot of people that have been calling me and writing me and emailing me. Yes, people actually still write letters. Don't know why, but it is what it is. They have been having open forum discussions on places like Clubhouse and Twitter Space and even Spotify Green Room, which I have, you know, my own rooms on these um, platforms. So you're welcome to join. We don't have set times for those yet. But again, that's the purpose of this growth prospect for the most part. But the context of the week or of most of last week was habeas corpus. Now, many of us have no real understanding of what that is or what it could be or how it's performed and who does it affect, how does it affect and all of these great things. And I've only, I think I've barely scratched the surface of habeas corpus. I think I did one video on it in four years and kind of just talking through it, not to it. But today you have an opportunity to get deeper. And for those that can actually fathom this, those that have signed up for the masterclass, you will have an opportunity to go even deeper than this discussion because today when I speak about habeas corpus I'm going to throw things at you that are still surface level in the master class you're going to understand what habeas corpus is you're going to understand how to weaponize it for yourself you're going to even have an opportunity to help others in their ventures for habeas corpus well Like I stated before, habeas corpus is the best and only sufficient defense for one's personal defense or personal freedom. What the hell does that mean? What happens is we all look at, you know what, let me me do this. We have a legal system with over 2.1 million people that are incarcerated. Habeas corpus is put out not necessarily for that 2.1 million people, although it is available to 2.1 million people. Doesn't mean that they will all be successful because again, a habeas corpus is purposeful. We know we have a fallible system. We know the system isn't perfect. We know the actors within that system are not perfect. We know from police officers to defense attorneys to prosecutors to judges, the system itself falls apart hand by hand, line by line, and then we're all programmed to believe by the televisions that we are getting to tell us lies to our vision that we have no defense from this infallibility. I want you to stay focused on that 2.1 million. There's 840,000 people currently in our jail systems that are simply there, not because they've gone to court and been um, found guilty, not because they've even been before a judge 
and had some form of adjudication other than bail. We're told that even in bail, that the prosecutor has to prove something, yet very seldom are they required to show such proof. Well, with that being said, I'm gonna give you this. I was not allowed to go to my bail hearing because I'm one of the few people that not only know that portion, but I understand the forced requirement. I understand how to weaponize not only habeas corpus, but all of my rights and their procedures. What makes it interesting in this case is 840,000 people are in our jail systems, not because they're guilty, not because they've been adjudicated, but simply because they can't make bail. Habeas corpus is available to them. Now, here's the next part. You have people that are picked up on bogus bench warrants. And I do mean it the way I just said that because we're filed with contempt of court. If you remember the contempt podcast I did, I spoke about how contempt is formed. Most people have no idea that once you are found in contempt, that is an actual case. There must be something proven. Why? Because the contempt is on a prior order that is already in force. If there is no prior order, then that contempt charge is actually void and you are now subject to unlawful arrest, which now takes us to the best and only sufficient defense of personal freedom, habeas corpus. You have someone picking you up on a bench warrant for something such as child support. Habeas corpus is one of those things that I actually spoke about from Latin in law because it simply means this, bring forth the body, or in some cases, you have the body. Habeas is have, corpus is body. So what you're doing is you're going to challenge the legality of an inmate's restraint of liberty. I want you to listen to that because a lot of people that I've listened to and even watched and even kind of helped, they use the fact that I'm going to use a habeas corpus. The habeas corpus is to challenge the legality of an inmate's restraint of liberty. An inmate's restraint of liberty. I'm going to keep going in that. Basically, this also happens when you have one of these police officers that do something as simple as make a decision, offer their own discretion. Whoops, the, their willful act by subjecting someone to felonious conditions. That's why when they're giving you instructions absent a crime, it is a Fourth Amendment violation. When they're doing your pat downs absent a crime or a probable cause to arrest, which only comes from a crime which is required for standing, all of these things, if it's absent, it is an unlawful arrest and you can exercise habeas corpus. Now, a lot of times it's used to examine extradition or even court jurisdiction. So here's, here's one of those. I'm going to give you one because, again, you guys already understand that I've been arrested a lot. You know, because I think somebody said, he's not a good guy. Doesn't change the facts of what I'm speaking about. Because there was once I was actually arrested and I can't even remember where it was I was arrested at. 
but they asked me did I want to challenge the extradition and I was like nah let's go ahead and get it out the way and then whenever I was I guess taken to wherever I was supposed to be taken to I was released but they could not release me in the other jurisdiction why because they didn't have the actual I guess cause to even keep me so we're we're just and they made it hey we're just holding you for them you don't have any charge with us. we're just holding you for them and when we got to them they like yeah we're good You've been incarcerated enough to go ahead and sweep this under the rug as if it never happened. It's amazing, too, because I'll get into that later. But it's also to overturn an invalid sentence or void judgment. It's used to overturn an invalid sentence or void judgment. Now, the reason why that's important is simply because there was this, these teenagers, 14, 15, 16 years old. They were incarcerated. They were subjected to questioning for 17 hours, hell without food and water. They were constantly lied to, you know, the 14, 15, 16 year old. And the prosecutor actually knew they weren't guilty. They each filed for habeas corpus. Two of them won their cases in which it actually offered them another opportunity for the prosecutor to continue prosecuting them even though she knew they were not guilty of the crime that they were being charged with. But she was stuck with this thing called a confession. The habeas corpus pointed out the interrogation techniques. The habeas corpus pointed out the subjecting these children to not only adult conditions, but to felonious conditions. It also pointed out the psychological damage that it was doing to these children. Because, you know, the interrogation itself is designed to fatigue, and force one into a state of the inability to think for themselves. It's designed to explode and expound upon one's irrationalities. And then you're being programmed into thinking these things are correct. Habeas corpus allows for these things to be put under the microscope and brought forth. Now, it seems like that was a little bit of a drag on, but when I don't put an actual name to it, you have an opportunity to think about what it is I'm saying. Because if I had spoke about the Central Park Five, immediately, many of you would have shut down just because you don't like the outcome, not the simple fact that these were children. And yet we excuse the actions of a police officer Don't worry about it, because again, I'm not gonna do very many more pauses for dramatic effect, but I want you to understand that that's where it's coming from, that's where it's at, that's what I'm speaking of. Because when we look at it, if it's okay to subject those children to this, what defense do they have for their personal freedom? If they're willing to subject, subjugate children to these type of offenses, what is their best and only sufficient defense for their personal freedom. Now, I actually went back and I, I, I sat down and I thought about that. Their sentences were invalidated simply because they were over-sentenced. When I spoke about child support, someone incarcerated for child support, and we talk about the reason they're in there is for a default judgment. What if that judgment is void? I've actually said that previous in like the first year I did this on here. 
understanding when I did the video about the child support from default judgment. A habeas corpus is actually set up to explore the voidness of that judgment. What if I give you something else? Because again, we're in a state, nation, country where it is illegal to imprison one for a debt, <clears throat> Las Vegas. But we are imprisoning men, and in some cases, women, for a debt, such as child support, if we go to North Carolina for other debts that one has incurred. Say that one more time. Nevada has a debtor's prison. The state of North Carolina has a debtor's prison. Hell, if you actually let Georgia tell it, they don't. Yet, Georgia has one of the highest number of men incarcerated for child support, which is a debt, not a crime. I'll get, I'll get into that. But a habeas corpus is one of those things that go after those default judgments, avoid judgments. Now, here's where, where I spoke about the 840,000. A habeas corpus is used to or address a denial of bond or its amount. Because remember I told you, in order to hold someone or have a high bond amount, the prosecution must prove that that person is a willful participant and likely to run or they are a danger to society. Now, here's the thing. Because my record in some cases, in most cases, were thrown out and expunged and vanished, they couldn't say I was a danger to society. Well, now they can no longer say that I'm likely to run. Why is that? Because remember I did a video and I talk about habitual behavior or habit behavior. That's actually a thing. My habit was to show up each and every time I had a court date when I was facing more than 2,000 years in prison. I'm going to say that one more time. My habit was to show up when I was facing 2,000 years in prison. Well, I lied. I'm actually showing you dramatic effect because I want, you, want that to sink in. If I'm facing 2,000, everything else is less than that. Everything else, unless I murder a block of people. I'm showing up, I'm coming to fight. So now they don't have any reason to deny me bond. Whoops. But they know they now have to prove it if I'm standing there. Because just like I tell people, no one wants to sit and face the devil or look the devil in the eye. It's more difficult to tell a man that's 300 pounds, six foot four, that doesn't smile, that he can't have what he wants. when they're staring me in the face. I understand that because people are taught not to be con confrontational. That's why we have so many people out here now that's passive aggressive. They'll give you an innuendo of, well, I really don't like him. I really don't like her. How does that change any of the things that's going on? Because whether you like me or not, whether I'm a good person or not, that doesn't change these facts. That doesn't change how habeas corpus works. That doesn't even change the purpose of habeas corpus. But again, being able to look the devil in the eye, being a participant in your own freedom is how habeas corpus works. You have to be willing to stand because like I told you, that citation, that ticket, that's the arena. They're, they're giving you the location. They're giving you the fight date. Now it's time you prepare to fight and be ready to win. That's it. 
You have the time. You have the place. Now you just need the trainer. You need to train, and then you need to do what the other athletes do when it's a big fight. They sequester themselves. They go away from all distractions because they get down and prepare for the fight because the fight winning is what's important to them. And they understand that I have to sacrifice in order to be successful because the sacrifice comes before success. Now I'm gonna even give you one better. The one thing that I loved was the simple thing of a guy was giving a conversation. It was a beautiful conversation. But the person he was giving the conversation to and with kept talking about instant gratification. He kept speaking about right now situations. And he said, that's the problem. The response was, that's the problem. And in understanding that's the problem, that's where everything changed. Because he said, you got to remember, sacrifice was the birth. It took nine months to create. You came through blood, sweat, and tears. Brought me to the, the, the what do you call that? The passage of Boaz, the prayer of Boaz. He was born in pain. That pain, that sacrifice, that suffering was before success. The success is actually the birth. And also, the one thing I speak about is the challenges. You are going to be challenged because you can't put new wine in old wine skins. You have to be willing to lose something to gain everything. If you won't sacrifice now, you will give up everything later. These are the things that I constantly speak about because these are the things that I've manifested in my own life. These are the things that I've not only experienced, I actually live by right now. And here's, here's the thing. When we're talking about the habeas corpus, it's only for those restrained from their liberty that may file a habeas corpus petition. Say that one more time, because again, whenever I spoke about it before, the challenge of the legality of an inmate's restraint of liberty. So it's only for those restrained from their liberty that have an opportunity to file. So when I'm talking about those addressing the denial of bail, those that are addressing the amount of bail, those that are addressing the void judgment, those that are addressing the invalid sentence, these are the people that are currently being held without just cause. Understand all of these go on together and it's based on, upon a denial of rights under the Constitution. Understand that every state's Constitution is based on the federal Constitution. Understand that. Because federal law is what guides each and every police officer, government agent. Because as I've gone through this, the one thing that you've noticed is federal law has not changed. Because when we talk about the fighting words doctrine, that holds steady in Georgia. It holds steady in Texas. It holds steady in Illinois. It holds steady in South Carolina, California, Florida, of all places. But it's the understanding. These are just baselines. So understanding where the baselines are and where everybody has to get to. I can set up all kind of stupid obstacles, but at the end of the day, I still have to be able to have a roadmap to get there. That's what this is. So while they're being guided in how to make sure they can manufacture money from you, I'm showing you how to make sure you can be left alone and keep yours to you. Working towards your dream, building your future, not theirs. Understanding how you can force them to be the people they said they were going to be. Now, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you something. Cause again, a lot of people don't take into account day 140,000. Because when we're looking at the microwave portion of it, a lot of us make right now decisions. We don't make decisions that affect 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Because we look at them as inconsequential. 
Why? Why would we consider something as significant as an arrest when we're living paycheck to paycheck as inconsequential? I actually spoke about this because I gave you an example of the issues with the voting bill as it stands. I even gave you my own experience based in that voting bill as it stands. A lot of people looked at it and like, well, that's not fair. You should be able to do this or you should be able to do that. And then when you use things like the immigrants are voting illegally. My question is those that are even legal are having an issue. So how can you say that they're doing it so easily unless that's the part that fits the narrative. But when you're giving someone the actual experience, you want to dismiss that because it doesn't fit that narrative. But here we go with this, the inconsequential part of it. It was the most amazing thing I had seen. I'm going to give you a story on that later. But there was a young lady. She was told, you're off paper. You can go register to vote in Shelby County, Tennessee. She went and registered to vote. She had got her voting rights back because she is now a citizen again. She was arrested and sentenced to six years in prison. She didn't vote illegally. She registered. She had proof that she was able to register. She was then allowed to register. But doing everything that she's supposed to, as she was supposed to have, she was arrested and sentenced to six years in prison. Now, fast forward, filed the habeas corpus, found out the she was over sentenced for one, and then the judgment that was laced on her was invalidated simply because she had proof that she acted in the right manner. She was then released. But that exact same Shelby County judge allowed a police officer. And I actually don't remember the guy's name, but I know his name was Brian O, I believe, Bryce. Brian O. Bryce actually forcefully raped a 14-year-old girl while he was a police officer. The age of consent in Tennessee is 18. This young lady is still not 18 yet. This judge that sentenced this woman for attempting to vote to six years said this police officer should not be punished for raping this child. Suspended his four year probation and allowed him to go on his merry way because he shouldn't have to suffer. He doesn't have to register as a sex offender. He gets to go on about his life. And in three years, this actually comes off of his record altogether. How is that? You have one person that's voting, another person that's raping. The collateral consequence is someone being arrested, sitting in jail, they lose out on their, their what do you call it, paycheck to paycheck. They lose out on that. So they're possibly losing their freedom outside of jail, right? Lose the freedom outside of jail. Now they lose their job. So they lose their means of actually getting money to not go to jail. Now they lose their rights. Even if they have yet to be convicted of a crime. Those are collateral consequences for things that are being placed in front of you based on simply being arrested on someone else's discretion without proof. This is why you have these things 
for the habeas corpus to be in place. These are why you have these things for the habeas corpus to be in play. Because again, it just sounded like a long-winded story that was stupid. Because it's like, where the hell is he going with that? Because again, when we're talking about these instances, when we're talking about these things, they seem simple in retrospect. But at the same time, they have long-term effects. So when we're talking about right now, that's not a real issue. Everybody makes a right now decision. Kings and queens understand we got to prepare for the future. We have to prepare for what's down the road. Yes, we got to win this battle, but we have to survive the battle. A habeas corpus allows us to survive the battle so we can win the war. Survive the battle. Don't have to win all of them. I talked to about preliminary hearings. Don't have to win all of them. Let me get a little let me get a little swig of my rock star so some of y'all can say I'm I'm do a little there we go rock star want you guys to understand but just just let that sink in for just a second just let that sink in for a second we're sitting up here and we're eyeballing these things and we're losing understanding because we're looking at right now effects we're not looking at the effects that happen down the road and that's where it matters the most. Because you look at the Central Park Five. What job were they going to get? They were in jail for 10 years. What effect were they going to do? Because they were teenagers when this happened. They were young teenagers, ninth and 10th, 10th grade. What kind of job were they actually going to have? What kind of life were they going to have now when they get out? What skill do they have? What skill have they gained? But the habeas corpus was used to weaponize their freedom because it was the best and only sufficient defense for their personal freedom. So when we're talking about these things, when we're gathering these aspects, it's understanding these are all parts of war. All of these are parts and tools for battle. That's what I'm preparing you for. Whether we're doing the listening, whether we're doing the watching, it is all the exact same thing. That is what I am here for. Many of us want to chime in and talk about this and talk about that, but we don't know the groundworks or even rules for what we're doing because I'm about to give you something else. The habeas corpus is used to challenge ineffective assistance of counsel. And I, keep, I, I try my best to emphasize assistance because you are the boss you are the one cutting the check. <clears throat> Excuse me. You are the one that makes the decision. If they don't follow it, there are consequences. But you are the one that must employ that consequence because you are sitting in the king's seat. The judge works for you. The prosecutor works for you because you are the public. The judges voted in by the public, you. The defense counsel works vigorously in assistance with you because you are cutting the check, not for their actual service, but for their expertise. That's why it's an assistant. They're not the head, they are just part. That's it. They follow instructions. Now. Many of us don't know anything about business or how to run a business or how to run anything that has any significance. That's where the problem lies in because we don't know how powerful we are. So whenever I did the poem and I talked about it is not our darkness that frightens us the most. It's our light. It's the simple fact that when we find out how strong we actually are, we become petrified because the more strength we have, our very strength invites challenges. As we get stronger, as we get better, the challenges become greater. As we achieve challenge after challenge after challenge after challenge, we then have an opportunity to sit back and look and say, you know what? I did that. 
And now every time we get that same challenge, it's easy now. Because we're strong enough to overcome that. These are the things that we have to understand. We have to find out what is turning on our light and how to keep it on. Because even, even my, my, um, my niece came, my little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light, of, it got on my nerves. But I understand because I don't want to ever extinguish that light. Because as long as she believes she's that light, as long as she allows that light to never be extinguished, as long as she believes that she's powerful, she is. As long as you believe your light is shining, it will. There will be a lot of people that try to extinguish it. You keep your light shining. That's what this is. Understanding you are the boss. You are the king. You are the queen. You're sitting in the king's seat. Everybody wants a shot at the king. Everybody. And just like the one, one of the things that actually had me rolling was I actually said it the other day and it, it was funny because my son, he was like, yeah, I'm the king, I'm the king, I'm the king. And I told him, I'm like, no, you're not. And I went and roughed him up a little bit. <laughs> and he cracked up laughing. And I told him, his mom looks at me and I said, said sometimes the king has to show these peasants why they're king. It wasn't that I was physically stronger than him, but it was because I understood the guy's war. I understood strategy. These are the things that made him a prince. It's because his succession is going to be based on his strategy, on the kingdom, and how to keep it surviving through battles so he can win wars. One of my, one of my favorite artists, or the hell, Caesars for the most part, is Marcus Aurelius. I actually sat down a few times and I've, I've read Meditations. If you have an opportunity, Meditations is a great book to read. It's one of those books that'll, that's long. It really is. But it gives you insight to understanding how to keep that light shining. Because it teaches you about focus. Regardless of what's going on on the outside, the focus remains steadfast. And it allows you to become greater than you are right now. And that should be the actual consequence and also the goal for what it is that you're trying to do. So when you're talking about the illegal or the ineffective assistance of counsel, it's remembering they're assisting you. They have to follow your instructions and they have to vigorously defend you in the manner you choose. Now, to go deeper into that, it can go into even if they're in court and they fail to object to something. Because even if their expertise tells them, no, we're not going to object right here. I've actually fallen into that category. I had an instance where a police officer was yapping. And my brother's attorney tapped me, hey, 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 you first chair. You have to object. And I told her, no. Let him talk. Now, did he say some damning stuff? Absolutely. The problem is I understood what my objective was. I didn't object because my objective was the one that meant something. Everyone at that table followed along. Why? Because they were my responsibility. I was sitting in the king's seat. That's what first chair means. I, whether it's sitting there defending myself, Alicia, or Mr. Jermaine, it was defending the ideals of why we all were sitting there. I was defending the ideals of why we all were sitting there. And I implemented a strategy which I felt was best for all of us which were the reasons for all of us sitting there. These are the things that we have to understand how to implement and not be afraid to move forward with. The thing I can appreciate is the fact that 
as much as scary, as stupid as some of the things I did were, there were no atheists in my foxhole because they stood right beside me and stayed there and stayed steadfast and followed me because I was sitting in the king's seat. They did not allow my light to be extinguished. Even when it got dim, I got a phone call. Had another one of my brothers call me and said, damn that, I don't have to be there, but I know who you are. Let them know who you are. You remember who you are. Basically what he said is, dude, I got the gas for that light right here. I got you. Because again, it's not about the objection itself, but it's about my plan, my implementation, my light. Everyone else works for me. And this is one I'm actually working on currently. The failure of your vigorous defense to pursue an appeal. And for them to defeat that, they would have to show that they actually pursued it. Which is actually funny because most of them don't know that they have to do that simply just to do that. And if they actually did. But anyway, here's the great part about it. It's still a part of ineffective assistance of counsel that allows in this habeas corpus. One of my favorite illegal search and seizure. Now, if you're not following me on a couple of my other social medias, you're probably going to see it in a little bit because I'm going to talk about this one because words have power and it's understanding the training. Remember I told you they were trained to be deceptive because they're revenue generators, not police officers. But the, the verbiage, you know, as one like, I am afraid for my life. Stop resisting. He's got a gun. You know, all those little colloquialisms that, you know, we randomly hear all the fucking time. But I'm going to give you one more. So you don't mind if I search you. Open-ended question because damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I got something for that. And it's kind of easy. And it was one, matter of fact, I'm going to give it to you now. So you don't mind if I search you or your vehicle. I do not consent. It was the first thing my youngest son said to me. I said so much, I do not consent, I do not consent. Go pick up your toys, I do not consent. Well, you're gonna get beat up if you don't. I do not consent, I do not consent, I do not. It got on my nerves, but it wasn't for him right then. I do not consent, it's for him as 10, 11 years old. I do not consent, it's for him at 30 years old. I do not consent, it's for him at 50 years old. I do not consent. I do not consent. I do not consent. Because if I know there are only two ways a police officer can, uh, what you call, pat you down, search you, legally, is one, your consent. You just withdrew that from any aspect. Or a judge. Why? Because they are not smart enough to determine what probable cause is. Not my words. It's a Supreme Court case I say all the time. That supports another Supreme Court case that I say all the time. But the funny part is, when we're talking about it, it bleeds into this next reason for a habeas corpus. And that's insufficiency of evidence or circumstantial evidence both of which are not evidence now when you're talking about circumstantial evidence circumstantial evidence can lead you into something that can be called an alfred plea which is alfred v north carolina which allows you to say hey i'm still innocent but uh let me leave a little leeway to where i can actually get out of this shit later you know, kind of leaves me. I'm still, uh, I'm going to go ahead and plead, but I feel I'm innocent. So I'm doing an Alfred plea. I'm going to go ahead and take this time because I don't see a way out of this. And that's generally because corruption for the most part. 
Because if you're vigorously defending and they, because I've never seen it. Line by line, precept upon precept, when you're going procedure by procedure by procedure by procedure, it is never followed. Why? Because it is not properly practiced. It's not properly taught. It's not putting them in a position which allows them to actually be successful at the thing that they're doing or attempting to do. Yet, none of us challenge it. And then when we do challenge it, we're the problem. And therefore, we don't look or seek out confrontation or even the ability to say you were wrong. These things are generally going to pop up because we're being arrested for things that aren't crimes. Things where no one has standing. You know, like jaywalking. That's a safety issue, that's not a crime. No one has standing because there's no injury. But again, these are things that we are criminalizing because yes, people are going to jail for jaywalking. I actually had a incident which was hilarious to me. And it was hilarious later because it was a cop that was stunned by the response. The guy asked me, he said, matter of fact, it was when I was arrested for the RICO. He asked me, when was the last time you was arrested? And I kind of chuckled because I said, hell yeah, I was, I was arrested uh, about two years ago because the police officer said my grandmother's truck didn't have, um, wasn't properly registered. Now, that's also a funny story, but I'll get into that later. And the cop said, nobody gets arrested. He's, this was his God-honest response. When I said, they said, nobody gets arrested for not having registration. Said, worst case, we'll tow the truck. He said, where were you at? I said, in front of my grandmother's house. And I literally got into a car accident in front of my grandmother's house. So, yeah, I'll, I'll get into that later. But he said, no, that's not going to, that, that didn't happen. So when he looks it up, he goes, oh, my God, he did arrest you for that. And then he goes, oh, my God, you've been arrested for some of the stupidest shit I've ever seen in my life. And he said, you are, you must be, like, an ass. I said, most of the time I just don't talk. I said, I'll say a couple things and I'll leave just like I did you. And he, he goes, oh, you're being arrested because they don't think you're going to do anything. I said, that's why it's been three years since I've been arrested. I'll let you catch that later because I'll let when it come back around, I'll let you catch that because it'll be on your second or third time when you catch that. So now I'm arrested for the Rico. It goes on, blah, 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 blah. I'm home, October 25th, 2012, 104 p.m. AJC, let's get it. Anyway, we're going to another reason for the habeas corpus is the conviction of an unconstitutional statute. Now, I've never gone into what actually makes these state statutes law or constitutional simply being just like just to give you an example six states had these new abortion law after six weeks you can't get an abortion they made it illegal they made it illegal for an elective surgery which an abortion is deemed after six weeks when the standard was set at georgia v borden or georgia v doe on the same day of roe v wade why is that? The standard was actually set already. They created another one. Not for the safety of these women. Not for the safety of the children. Not for the benefit of these children. Not for the benefit of the will women. And then why only six? Why not 50? So you had 44 states said, no, nah, we're good. Because it's already been set. But six said, yeah, we, we're going to do that. And then you had Brian Kemp come out and say, you know what? Yeah, we didn't actually expect them to go through. Why? Because they were unconstitutional. Why is that? Why did they not expect, the six not expect that to go through? Because even every aspect of understanding the statute itself, understanding what created it, understanding the reason the programming is working there was no resistance that's why it went through on the six 
they didn't expect it to go through it it performed better than they had ever planned this was something that i'm actually for those of you that are catching the code that i just dropped that was actually something that was said in 1964 it's going better than we actually even planned this shit. the resistance is not there the revolution will not be televised that was my thing that was the thing that we were going through in the 80s the revolution will not be televised Because the revolution itself is not done outside. It's for what's in here. Most of us had no idea what we were talking about, what was being expressed to us through the matrix. They weren't trying to get Neo's body. They weren't trying to get his soul. They were attacking his free will. They was going after his mind. Because to actually be free, it takes energy, it takes effort. That's why babies are so happy. Ignorance is bliss. They don't know anything. So they're not responsible for anything. And at the same time, they're looking for answers. They're looking for guidance. It's only when that guidance stops is when they become derailed and their light starts to dim. But but see how, see how we're working all this again? Anyway, we're going to get to the last. Yeah, we're going to get to the last one. And it's unfair trial. The unfair trial is probably the most significant thing. Because you look at, I did a podcast where I named, I think I stopped at 13 innocent people, knowing, knowingly innocent people that we've executed here in the United States. We've actually, I believe we executed three here in Georgia, knowingly, due to an unfair trial. Not understanding the weaponizing of the habeas corpus, not understanding, understanding the weaponizing of our defense, but using these tools as weapons also deals with timing. Because habeas corpus can be used within 180 days for a misdemeanor. A felony, you have four years. So, you know, cacao, you say, hey. But you have an extension on death penalty cases. The reason being is because death penalty, you're not going anywhere. Ain't no rush. And the one thing a state hates to do is apologize for their indiscretions because they got to get paid from you first. If you're going and you're currently in a state court and you're filing habeas corpus, it must be filed in a superior court unless you're going federal. Federal court inmates or federal inmates must file in federal court. Let's not start. But if you're in state court, it must be filed in superior court. And one of the things you must prove is that there was direct interference by either the prosecutor for not turning over something or which is more likely the case because you know I've actually given you the means of how they can not turn something over lawfully because I'm even going to go into the one thing that makes uh, and <laughs> it's going to be ticklish it's going to be ticklish because what makes a cop saying something a lawful order and you'll be surprised that none of them know that's the one thing that, that it's, it's, it's so funny because they have no idea what the show of authority is but when you have something such as making a fact or a legal claim that was not available at the time, or even a judge showing prejudice or bias, I've had both of those in the RICO trial. I actually put those on the record, which is probably why we can't find the record. Anyway, what makes this difficult to beat, because again, knowing is half the battle, and like I said, I'm wrapping this up a little bit. There's a presumption in favor of the conviction because most of us don't understand, just like I told you with the Central Park Five, even when they won on habeas corpus, the prosecution continued to push forward knowing there was somebody else's DNA that and had confessed and had given details that wasn't 
available to the police, but she still convicted these children. She still had to push for that conviction. She had to push for depositions, or testimony, sworn affidavit, transcripts, and even the actual evidence. This is what makes it more difficult because it's almost like you're retrying the exact same case. And this is where it goes into the separation because this is where I help you separate these things even in a master class. It's the understanding of not only looking at what's there, you have to know what's not there. Because the nature of the beast doesn't change. The, 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 the leopard never changes its spots. And any other crazy-ass colloquialism that you can come up with applies here. Because if you're challenging a guilty plea, the prosecutor must show knowingly, voluntarily, and the plea itself was made intelligently. and voluntarily. What happened is knowingly and intelligently made. Those two generally are a lot because you signed it. The voluntarily, because you remember mens rea, the guilty mind. Remember I talked about the tactics. 17 hours without sleep. You know, it's called sleep deprivation. Not giving food or water. These are things that are used at Guantanamo Bay for torture interrogations. This was used on a 14, 15, 16 year old child. 14, 15, 16 year old child. 14, 15, 16 year old child that made a confession. How can it be voluntarily? when those tactics were employed. So it's not only what's there, it what's not there. You have to attack the arrest time. You have to tack on to the time of the actual voluntary confession. That's a lot of time. Then you go into the age. These are things that are done not only through retrospect but it's understanding it's not only what's there but what's not there because even in the in the guise of this if somebody's taking a trial for double something that would actually interject double jeopardy when you go into a place such as this guilty plea and it's done through self-incrimination you know when a police officer tells you a flat-out lie when you file for a speedy trial and it is not obliged for a lawful reason. When you actually have a biased or impartial jury. When you do something like jaywalk and there are confrontation issues, no standing. You're in jail for something that there is no victim to. Cruel and unusual punishments and due process concerns. Due process concerns, ineffectiveness of counsel, speedy trial issues are probably going to be the one thing or the things that are going to stand out the most when you're filing habeas corpus. The reason being is because one, Thomas Sotomayor question. He gave you a pyramid of five. He gave you the top, but we, we know that it's flipped around and inverted. We have the police officers who don't know law. You have the prosecutors who don't care about law or evidence. You have defense attorneys that don't defend, and then you have the judges that don't care either way. Why? Because it's about revenue. And then we have you who don't fight back. That's the five. So when we're lost looking at issues of sentencing, due process, the key component is you. 
your willingness to fight back. Because I could actually go through another podcast on its own for cruel and unusual punishment. Because these are pretty much cries from inmates that are on death row that are lethal injection that are electrocuted because again the reason why the death penalty in most case in most states are abolished simply because when you're poisoning something or you're using a system of absolution and a system that is highly flat fallible it becomes a problem when you're executing men and women that you know are innocent. We're having a permanent solution to something that doesn't have a permanent standing. Now, one of the things that you can do, because again, I, I told you I'm gonna go deeper in the master class, but one of the things that you do is immediately from unlawful impeachment, it must be filed against the holder of the inmate, which is usually the warden. Now, federal statutes provide federal courts authority to habeas corpus, corpus relief for state prisoners. And that's 28 U.S.C. 2241 through 2256. Now, remember, petitioner must be in custody when filed. And a petitioner must have exhausted all forms of relief must be done in writing and signed by petitioner or someone acting on the petitioner's behalf or the behest of the petitioner. Now, understanding this, today is just an overview, but going deeper into habeas corpus. But we all must figure out what it is that we want. Malcolm X had a thing. Man that will not stand for anything will will die. I can't even remember right now. I just it, I immediately went blank. A man will not stand for something will die uh, will fall for anything. A man who will not stand for something will fall for anything. He who chooses comfort over consequence. You know, I actually just I want to sound intelligent at the end of this thing. It just it's just not working for me right now. But I want I want to leave you guys with something. If we don't choose to defend ourselves, if we don't choose to challenge those that we put into authority, which we don't even understand what authority is or where it comes from or where it originates or how it originates, we're lost. If you're not willing to allow your light to shine, you have a problem. Because if you're willing to concede everything that you build or do, or if you're willing to just hand over everything that God gave you, you don't deserve anything. Because every time you allow a police officer to not properly police, you're telling them it's okay to do it. You are sparing the raw and spoiling the child. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Every time you look the other way, when someone does something that's out of line, that is quote unquote, in a position of authority, you are telling them that it's okay to continue doing it. And it's not just you that they're going to affect. It's going to be those that are around you and everyone that looks like you. Because it doesn't get better by ignoring a problem. You have to address it head on. You have to be willing to confront those that are putting themselves in confrontational situations. So understand this. You have an opportunity to be free. You have an opportunity to live as you wish. As long as it's not affecting the outcome or earthliness of others. You have a freedom to choose you. 
But when you're forcing those beliefs onto others, that's where the problem comes in. So when those beliefs are being thrust upon you, you have the right to reject them. That's why you don't have to participate in the police investigation. That's why you have the right to remain silent. That's why they are in service to you, not the other way around. That's why if they give you instructions absent of crime, it is illegal. That's why if they tell you, I'm going to arrest you for not participating, not cooperating, you're what is the interfering in an investigation. The simple question is, what are you investigating? Because I don't know doesn't get you a warrant. Is may I pat you down is I don't consent. Do, do you believe I have any weapons? I don't know will not get them a search warrant. Because ignorance is only bliss in the eyes of the Lord. So at the end of the day, if they're not properly policing, they need to be taking off the uniform and giving back everything that they've given was taken from you.